Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. I don't have a historical piece for you today, but I have what has to be the quintessential 70s Les Paul custom. This is just the base model custom that everybody pines for. I don't know a single Les Paul fan that doesn't want a beautiful custom, and this is always what comes to my mind when I think Les Paul custom. But this beauty is from 1978. In this year, there were six main colors. You have wine red and cherry sunburst, which are the least popular options today on the used market. But you also had white, which is always popular for Randy Rhodes, black popular because, well, customs were originally only supposed to be black, tobacco sunburst, and 78 was actually the first year for silver burst. You might also find a few custom orders or a few limited edition runs that eh, it, it, you just get going down a rabbit hole. This is supposed to just be a simple episode. As my channel has grown, so has the collectors that have entrusted in me to find them really nice examples. And I have like four or five people where we're all saying the same thing. We love the 78 and 79s. There's not really a definitive feature behind them. It's just, there's something nice about them. They usually have slightly thinner neck profiles to them. If you're looking for something a little bit chunkier that's still in 60s neck territory, I would suggest something like a late 75 to 76. I usually find those have a little bit more meat to them, but I mean, they're very similar in feel anyways. But pickup wise, it'll all be the same. You'll have the T-top pickups in this era. You'll have the Nashville style bridge, which is fairly new at this point, around 1975 being its introduction. 78s will have these reflector knobs. The 79s will have the speed knobs. Sometimes you'll find a late 78 with the speed knobs. It, it's just kind of a hodgepodge of parts. But prices for these things have just been going up lately. And I think it's because of what I said at the beginning. These are just the quintessential Les Paul customs if you like the 70s era stuff. When you think classic rock, this is the tone you're hearing. This is what a lot of your famous people ended up using at that point in time. And this is the era that I feel most at home with, most excited to get a guitar from. Pretty much the only downside to these instruments that people will complain about is they're heavy. Yes, this one's a little over 10 pounds, but it's balanced really well between the neck and body. I was surprised that this thing didn't weigh about nine pounds. Another thing, some people don't like the multi-piece maple tops. This one is a three-piece top. It's blended pretty well, in my opinion. This one has a beautiful plain top to it, but some people only want that center seam. So let's go ahead, throw this one on the workbench. We'll take a look at its individual parts. Backside of the neck pickup reads June 1st, 1978, and these are the factory original T-tops. They get the name because if you remove this cover, the tops of the bobbins will have T's on them. Inside the neck pickup route, you can see it says tobacco sunburst, and it looks like maybe a 6 or a 9 stamp. Bridge pickup reads May 10th, 1978, and it looks like you have a 10 stamp in there. I'm not really sure what those number stamps mean, but I see them all the time. The Nashville style bridges for this era will be Schaller made in Germany. If you take a close look, you can see it says made in Germany right there. As far as knowing your tailpiece is original, this is what you should see. The middle line does not extend to the edges. That's how you know it's been replaced. But this one is original. I honestly think this one looks pretty good without the pick guard even, but I'll definitely leave that on there. These have your typical maple tops. You can find anywhere between two to five piece tops. I mean, then they are on top of a solid mahogany body with an ebony fretboard and maple neck in this era. The ebony fretboard on this example is gorgeous. You've got a lot of nice wood grain within it, nice dark color. I just finished conditioning this one. As far as the frets go, you obviously do have some wear here, but the only thing that I think you really need to be aware of is like on the first fret, you have a little bit more divoting to it, but nothing that really affects play and you could easily level recrown that out. 
face of the headstock with the truss rod cover removed, you can see the maple neck right there. That's always a good way to check if you have a maple or mahogany neck. Sometimes you can't see it because it'll be covered over in black paint on modern era guitars, but for these 70s and 80s ones, normally you can see it. And you have your beautiful Gibson logo and custom block inlay. We have a 1.67 inch nut width, which increases to 2.03 inches at the 12th. Neck depth at first fret, 0.85 inches, which then gets kind of beefy, 1.04. And the typical 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length. The neck pickup on this example reads 7.33k ohms, and the bridge pickup is a little bit hotter at 7.4ish. These things will usually read anywhere between 7 and 7.5. Moving on to the back side here, everything's looking good in the control cavity. Something else that's characteristic of this era of Gibson is you have what is considered the ashtray shielding tin. They use those tins to encapsulate this area instead of actually drilling a ground wire. That's a very common modification you'll see on these instruments. Somebody will drill a ground wire and get rid of that whole system for a better grounding experience. Does it necessarily hurt the value of the instrument? No, because most people don't even realize it's ever been done. But we have all matching 16th week of 1978 pot codes on this one. And it's a pretty clean factory job here too. Take a look at that beautiful wood grain as well. And I always love these maple necks. I think it's better than mahogany, but... You know, when I was first introduced to these old Gibsons, this is what I found first, so a lot of it comes from that. A lot of people will still stick their noses up at maple necks, but I personally like them. Beautiful serial number and Made in USA stamp here. So that's 1978, 201st day of the year, second in production for the day. Well, it's technically the third because there is a 500 number. This particular example weighs 10 pounds, 2.7 ounces. Now that we know how this guitar is made, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. <laughs> So the only thing that's really wrong with this instrument is the pickups have gone microphonic. What that means to you 
is they're like super sensitive essentially. So if you're scraping your hand against it, you're gonna hear it more. Which can kind of get annoying as your palm muting and picking. It's mainly prevalent during like solos. Also, if you're closer to your amp, they're gonna start squealing. Which can kind of be unpleasant, but yet there's also some people out there that love this because it makes them slightly more aggressive sounding. But in order to fix that, you just need to wax pot them. So I'll leave that up to you if you want to do that or not. Now that we know how this instrument sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. This is a fantastic players grade Les Paul Custom from 78. It had two previous owners to me, and it's been really well taken care of. You can see you've got some light scratches, nicks and dings on the face of the headstock, but it presents pretty well. The lacquer hasn't super aged, but it, you know, it's got a little bit of yellowness to it. Important for you is the truss rod works perfectly fine. You're nowhere near maxed out territory. The threads aren't past the top of the nut. I've got to tell you guys, I've been having a hard time getting customs with maxed out or near maxed out truss rods. It's to the point where I'm just sending them back at this point. The frets do show some wear as we saw on the inside look. Again, mainly just on that first fret, but it's nothing that's like fretting out or anything. A level recrown job would easily get rid of it all, but it's not necessarily needed right away. So fretboard was just conditioned and cleaned as were the frets. Nothing really to worry about here. The face of the guitar, it's got lots of light nicks and dings and scratches. I'll just kind of run the light over it here so you can see all of those but it definitely presents pretty well. I did polish this side of the instrument because you know that's where somebody's arm's always at, so it's kind of dulling up the finish, but it cleaned up pretty nicely there. This example is all original, well, except for the strings. You've got scratches on the pick guard there, and just again, these light nicks and dings. The gold's pretty much all worn off the tailpiece. It's pretty inexpensive to replace these with vintage correct parts that look a little bit cleaner if you're looking for a more goldy looking one. The only thing that would be hard to replace is this pickup cover with an era correct part, but honestly, the tarnishing's not too bad on that one. Back of the headstock, serial number 72018502, made in USA. Now you can see you've got a few light nicks and dings around the top edge of the headstock here. But it's looking pretty good. I just love the burst on the back of the headstocks. Because you've got it there, you've got it on the neck. I mean, if you didn't notice it, you also have it on the sides of the headstock. It just looks so good. There is a ding right here. It's not a very deep ding. You really can't even feel it, even if you put your finger there. But you can definitely see it kind of bubbled up the lacquer a bit, but no breaks, cracks, or repairs. I'm guessing we might see some clear coat wear under black light, because you do have a few areas like right here, where you have a small chip in the finish, as well as up here. Something else that'll be a little bit difficult to see is there are some finish checking lines where the binding truly ends and the neck meets the fretboard. There's just a few of those areas here, but nothing structural. Very common to see on these, and you've got the typical fret edge cracks. What that's caused by is just the expanding and shrinking of the neck, and the frets don't change size depending on humidity, things like that. You will be hard pressed to find an old Gibson, or even a new Gibson for that matter, any older than a couple of years that, that doesn't have those little binding cracks. The back side of the instrument, it does have some buckle worming. It's a pretty mild case of it for the most part. I mean, you definitely see it when you get it in the light just like this, right? But, you know, don't have it in the light. It looks pretty darn good in my opinion. All the electronics, as we saw, untouched, perfect, awesome. But you do have some nicks and dings here on the back as you're seeing here. So this one, it's not collector's grade, it's player's grade, but it's not trashed player's grade. So it's not gonna be the cheapest example in the world, but it's not gonna be top, top dollar either. 
can see you've got your metal jack plate there, which is original. And even the original strap buttons, those are usually the very first things to go on these guys. And 78, you're pretty much out of pancake territory by 78. Sometimes you'll find one still lingering around, but this one is not a pancake if that's something you're worried about. Under black light, we can see all the original finish is intact. You really don't have any super finish wear on the front here. Knobs are glowing the way you want to see. Everything's looking good there. Take a look around the edges. Same story. Spoiler alert, there are no major issues with this instrument. This is just, you know, full disclosure stuff right here. Everything's looking good here. We'll take a look around the sides of the neck. That way you're not worried about that. And on the back. So it looks like I was wrong. There's no clear coat wear here, but you do have those small little chips that we were talking about earlier. It almost looks like a little bit of stand rash or something like that on that part of the neck. Take a quick closer look at the neck heel there. Everything is good. And the back of this beautiful headstock. So we are in the clear for this vintage beauty. This instrument comes in an era correct generation two Gibson chainsaw case. Only issue to note here is one of the three latches has broken off, but the front one here and the back one there do still function. And what's kind of nice about still having this is that it still just latches in place and functions like normal. So at this point, even though these two are unlocked, it actually keeps the case closed. You cannot open it. So when you go to open this for the first time, don't be like me and go, uh-oh, did I break it? <laughs> no, you're good. But this one's got a nice padded handle. That's always been my favorite thing about these cases. And I just love the protection these things offer. This is my absolute favorite case of all time. Now this one does not have a lid ribbon. Mostly all of them did at one point in time, so it's likely broken off. The hinges still support the lid, but I mean, it's a little bit floppy. So in the future, they might not do that, but it doesn't look like we have any major rust going on here. You've got a little bit up here. The case has that beautiful vintage odor to it. It kind of smells like mothballs, essentially. That, that's just the vintage Gibson scent. It truly is. And whenever a guitar smells like that, it's like, mm-hmm. Yep, because that's what my first 2550 smelled like, too. So it's not necessarily a foul odor, it's, but it, it definitely is a smell. But my favorite thing about this example, besides just being so beautiful and having this case, is it has so much original case candy, which is so hard to find on these older guitars. So this is for the chainsaw case itself. What's kind of cool is it's for the very first generation of chainsaw cases. Like the very early ones that had this extra padding around here that you'll find on like Marauders and things. Because obviously you can see here, this one does not have that additional padding. I've seen this particular piece of paper sell upwards of 150 bucks because this is a hard piece of case candy to find. This is one I haven't personally had before. It just talks about Norlin and how they say all their products are quality and whatnot. I've had a few of these. It just tells you that they have a clear receipt for transportation. This is the warranty pamphlet for the case. It doesn't appear that it was ever filled out or anything. This is the warranty for the instrument, which is definitely more important to have filled out. And they did. You have the matching serial number. And here's a really cool thing, the original hang tag. You can see brand new, 849 bucks. Then with case, they charge another hundred. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this 1978 Gibson Les Paul Custom in a gorgeous tobacco sunburst finish, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to my reverb for sale page. Thank you troglodytes for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.